Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the stream tonight. And uh, thank you for joining. And uh, thanks very much to the to the Rusty Days team uh, for pulling this amazing event together. It's it's really exciting to be part of it, and it's really exciting to see so many people from so many different parts of the world on um, on an online Rust conference. Um, a little bit about I'm t tonight. I'm going to talk about um, encrypted backups and and how you um, how you actually create encrypted backups using Rust. Um, but before we step into the meet, um, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, I work in security software as a day job, and I code Rust as a day job. At Redshift, I work on Ingrain D, which is a hardware, um, a cloud monitoring agent, which uh, runs Rust in the Linux kernel as as eBPF modules. Um, it's been very, very exciting and interesting how Rust allowed us to actually lower the barrier to entry to something as technical and as um, in the grain, so to say, as the Linux kernel. Um, and actually, the libraries that, that we were able to build using Rust are really, really pleasant to use, um, as opposed to the C interfaces. And, and we can provide a complete tool chain. Um, so we're using Ingrain D for monitoring um, the, the cloud data and cloud uh, network traffic. But today, um, I will talk about a little bit different aspect of cloud protection. And when I say cloud, what I really mean is somebody else's computer. And when I say cloud storage, what I really mean is storing your holiday pictures on somebody else's computer. Um, the problem is that really our only layer of protection in most of the cases, especially if you're using software provided by the big five is privacy policies. Um, these are not generally super helpful in terms of protecting your privacy. Uh, they are very often designed to be deliberately vague. And um, we surely can do better. And some of that better is uh, encryption at rest. If you go to a service provider's website, they very often tell that the, they are they provide military grade encryption to your data, and that is going that is what is going to keep it secure. However, encryption at rest is only really useful if the military literally breaks into the data center and steals the hard drives that store your data. For any type of online attack or uh, sort of going through the front door. Uh, like the Twitter hacks that we've that we've seen recently, that type of encryption is not going to your data at all. It's it's almost as if it wasn't there. So the idea is that we have to end to we use end to end encryption, and this is a buzzword that's been going around in the media quite a lot recently. Um, the idea of end-to-end -end encryption is to encrypt your data on the client and make sure that only the client can decrypt that data and the server is completely unaware of what's in that. Now, if you think about your holiday pictures, this is obviously much more preferable to uh, allowing any sort of systems administrator to even inadvertently take a look at your pictures. Um, if you use end-to-end -end encryption, you can be sure that it is only you or you, whoever you authorized um, that will actually access that piece of information. However, when you're writing software for um, for encrypting, and especially backups and photos and, and those types of files, you kind of have to pick your battles wisely. The, uh, the existing software that's out there, um, they use Normally, they normally tune it towards the security side of um, of the spectrum. But I think there was a lot of development in the past sort of 10 years in cryptography that um, that demolished this dichotomy of of performance versus security. So we can actually approach the problem in a way where we are both fast and we are both correct. And this is where us comes into the picture. It really helps us with the correct part. So how do we actually 
performance, uh, just in general. Uh, we have to minimize the latency, maximize the throughput, and uh, and then profile and tweak, and then rinse, repeat. Um, what you're going to notice on the slides is that performance needs to be designed into a system. Um, before you actually start implementing something, you need to think about uh, how that is, going, that is going to be used and what sort of uh, people are going to use it and then embed these assumptions into your design uh, to provide the, the user experience that you're targeting with, uh, with, the, with the optimal scenario. When I say latency, what I really mean is the time to the first bit of response. Um, and you, you can measure this in nanosecond or milliseconds. Um, you can, when you're reading a file from a server, uh, for instance, you're accessing your Google Drive or your iCloud account, you're sending a request to the service provider. Uh, the service provider will do a lookup on their side, um, execute some sort of business logic, and then return to you with your data. Now, the latency is the first bit of response after this entire cycle has been done from the time that you finished sending your request. Um, Obviously, in a, in, uh, in a network scenario, this is probably hundreds of milliseconds. But when you're uh, reading from a disk or an SSD, that is going to be uh, orders of magnitude different uh, and lower. Even between spinning rust, uh, as in conventional HDDs or SSDs, there can be huge differences. Really, really interesting one is uh, syscalls. Uh, whenever you access the operating system, you execute a syscall. Um, so typically opening a file or sending data through the network or reading or writing to a file are all system calls um, that involve some level of latency because of the way operating systems generally work. And this can be significant if you're dealing with large amounts of data or large amounts of files. Throughput is the time to completion, and we usually uh, measure this in gigabytes per second or megabytes per second. Um, this is a property of encryption algorithms or compression algorithms. Uh, it is a property of your network link. Uh, you buy, you normally in Europe, you purchase uh, your internet service based on the uh, throughput that you will get um, in, in an ideal scenario. And it is also a property of the disk. Uh, not only the lookup speed is what matters, but also the actual speed at which you extract data from, from a disk. Um, now, that, now that we have uh, an idea about uh, these sorts of terms, um, I want to talk a little bit about zero stash. And, and what my aim was with, with designing this, um, this piece of library. Um, so I wanted to hide all the metadata. This is this is a really really interesting uh, aspect of it, I think, because there's a lot of um, metadata that we store on our file systems, and especially in backups, uh, they can expose a lot of stuff. Um, it is deduplicated, so we save some space. Um, it's a nice to have. It's not. It wasn't really a big effort to implement it within the system, um, but most importantly we can actually use this as an online file system that doesn't necessarily expose all of the data. Um, and this is, this is really exciting because it also means that whenever a user logs into a cloud service, we can also use the zero stash format as a, a key value store where we use their personally identifiable information. And do this in a way that the server has no idea about whether does does not necessarily need to have an idea um, if the users uh, are accessing their data or or which parts of the data they are accessing. So in order to achieve uh, sort of fast programs, um, the first step is to minimize latency. A lot of backup software that are out there they are deduplicating your data by generating large numbers of files, which is ideal from a lot of, um, from a lot of um, 
aspects of the, of the design space. Most importantly, it reduces the complexity within the backup software itself. However, um, large numbers of small files means that you're accessing your files more frequently. So what I thought would be a good idea is to pack uh, all of these into relatively large uh, objects uh, and pack these objects densely so that we minimize the, uh, the access to the file system or the network whenever we're synchronizing or decrypting um, the, the data. It is large enough to be efficient. Four megabyte happens to also kind of align with um, access sizes of SSDs and which gives us a really nice alignment and, and actually a, a speed bump theoretically. Um, but also it's, it's, a, it's a very versatile file size, I feel. Um, for different use cases, you can increase that or this, decrease this potentially. Um, but the key thing is that we only work on four megabyte uniform objects that, that densely pack our data. The raw structures that access this uh, uh, so object, which is also represented as an object in zero stash, uh, look like this. Uh, there's a, it's a generic thing because it's a, it um, generally works on a file on a buffer. Um, and there doesn't need to be anything else. Um, but a buffer, uh, it has a capacity, it has a cursor, uh, and it has an ID. And the object ID is um, just uh, 32 bytes of random. Um, the capacity is interesting because we need to reserve some uh, space at the end of the file uh, for uh, cryptographic tags and, and a number of other accounting pieces. And the cursor is something that, um, that I actually uh, lifted over from um, the STD libraries um, read-write implementations. Um, but I did this for the, for the sake of performance. And the usual way of interacting with this object is, is actually initializing it with a, with a block buffer as the, uh, as the buffer. Um, and I talk about this later why. Step two, uh, choose the right primitives to maximize the throughput. Um, we're still in design space. We're not, we're just kind of playing around with the theoretical maximums. Um, so for indexing, um, we need cryptographically strong primitives um, because the large numbers of files and because of the security properties that these provide. So I went with the Blake 2, which is not a standard, um, a standardized hash function, but it is um, generally considered very strong and uh, it, can, it can scale to very high performance, especially with um, efficient implementations. As you for, um, it's pretty much the same deal. It's battle tested. Um, it doesn't come from any sort of large software vendor. There's an open source implementation out there. Uh, it's been used for ages. Um, it's, a, it's a trusty workhorse. The Chacha 20 poly construction is something from the house of Daniel Bernstein. Um, this is an authenticated encryption algorithm. And the, um, the benefits of this is being really, really fast and um, also providing us with, with, with the properties that we would normally expect from modern cryptographic primitives. Um, and for deduplication, I'm using C hash, which does like 10 gigabytes per second um, for hashing. Uh, it is absolutely a non-cryptographic hash, but it is, it is generally very, relatively hard and, um, and really, really fast. Now, at this point, we have some free optimizations. Um, even though the standard library offers uh, a lot of primitives for us to use, especially for asynchronous programming, um, there, are, there are many, many crates that offer basically free performance boost. 
uh, for channels between multiple processes. Uh, Crossbeam channel offers uh, quite a big speed up. Um, the Crossbeam utils package uh, crate um, provides us with a with a threading implementation that um, is generally a bit more versatile than uh, whatever is found in uh, the standard library. And uh, the RV lock, RW lock uh, implementation in the standard library is, um, I don't want to offend anyone, but it doesn't have a great reputation in terms of performance. Uh, so there are alternatives to like drop in alternatives to it that exist. However, for my use case, uh, I was better off using a parallel um, hash map library, which is dash map, and it's amazing. Um, it is really, really fast. It makes accessing um, data from multiple threads really, really easy and, and provides a great API for doing so. Um, I mentioned that Blake 2 can actually achieve really high performance whenever you, uh, when you get a really efficient implementation. And, um, and that means that there is a really efficient implementation in Rust, um, which is the, uh, this is the SIMD implementation. Um, as a bonus, the Rust Argon2 library also uses this uh, as part of its Argon2 implementation. So we're actually reducing the compile times while um, getting, getting a really, really nice um, Blake2 speed. LZ4 is just a wrapper for the C library. Uh, I kind of compared it to with, with a couple of other crates like minis, but um, LZ4 is just very versatile and very tunable. Um, and C hash, uh, it's, it's again, a no brainer, great API, great implementation, really fast. Um, and we're getting this, all of these speed ups without actually having done any work. Um, we're just using the right crates. Obviously, the way that I learned that these are fast involved a lot of uh, profiler-driven development and, uh, and kind of like trying out everything that's out there, um, looking at, at how complex the dependencies are and, and try to vet them a little bit. Um, but I think um, the bottom line is that there are lots of great crates out there uh, that we can appreciate and that, that actually bring in free optimizations if, you, if we're just using them. Now, um, we have kind of achieved a space where we're comfortable with the primitives that we're using. And now we should figure out how to um, design an implementation. And the point is, and one of the one of the great things about Rust is that the implementation design can really follow principled engineering. Um, good programs copy, fast programs steal or borrow. Um, the point is, we don't want to copy data a lot of times, um, and borrowing data actually makes um, accessing the same buffer very very efficient and uh, also statically checked by the Rust compiler which is often the root of error in other languages. Another principle that I followed is that you kind of have to trust the operating system and the compiler to know the right thing within reason. Um, they are really, really smart, generally speaking, but they're also not always uh, smart enough to figure out what you mean precisely as a developer. Um, there was a there was a question on Twitch from Frega Daleta. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, which asked whether it would make sense to have the hash um, be the ID of the buffer. I think um, in terms of cryptographic construction, I don't really want to go into the, all sorts of the, all the security details that um, that were chosen. Um, I've documented these in the repository under uh, in a document, um, but generally there are a couple of trade-offs with the with the indexing mechanisms. 
um, that were that were actually like part of this design loop. Uh, how can we how can we most efficiently index uh, the objects themselves and then the data within the objects? Um, the bottom line is that the the way that we pack the objects themselves doesn't really lend them to um, hashing uh, that easily, and we get some security properties from from other places. So the big picture of the program and and how we actually want to structure um, compressing uh, uh, a bunch of files into um, into our objects it looks like this. Um, we open a file, we mmap the file into memory, which uh, which basically creates a, a memory area um, that is equivalent in size to the file itself. Uh, so we can just access that um, access that file as if it was a buffer in Rust. And then we go through this, we run the deduplication algorithm, and then uh, uh, we check if we've already stored that um, piece of information in our index. And if we haven't, then store it, and then um, just do some other bookkeeping. Um, and do this, do this in a single thread. Now, we've kind of like have a, a rough idea of the implementation. Um, it's very, very important to start profiling. And um, I actually started profiling very early on in order to, to figure out where the bottlenecks are. Um, Perf, it works greatly on Linux. You get really, really detailed output and um, uh, software like Kcash Grind um, can actually load perf files in a graphical environment, but perf on the command line is also very powerful if you depend if you happen to be debugging on a server. Um, but a lot of times I was just using OS, which um, as you can see on the screenshot, um, and this is a release build that we're looking at, actually resolves um, all the symbols and the binaries, uh, and and we can start digging into. Uh, the nitty gritty details of of our execution and and runtime, and I'll come back to the profiler um, several times during during the presentation. Now that we have an idea about how much everything costs in real life, uh, we have an implementation. We uh, we know how to profile it. We have um, pretty good primitives. We've optimized our data structures so that uh, that we reduce the the access latency. We can start actually tweaking things. And this these things some of some of the the things that I'm mentioning actually like make a lot of difference. First and foremost, uh, one of the things that I um, uh, I was trying to optimize for is reducing the number of copies. Um, this is this is super important um, for reasons I'm going to go into later. Um, slice access generates a boundary check. These boundary checks can be very costly. Um, link time optimization, at the best case, you can you can get around um, 20, 30 percent. Um, worst case, it probably equals out. Some gotchas about inlining, uh, reducing size on the reducing code size on a hot path. Um, pipelining and uh, crypto hash libraries uh, using SIMD that I mentioned. This is actually incredibly important because the SIMD speedups are significant. I don't consider myself smart enough to write SIMD code myself. So I was mostly leveraging other people um, who have put in the great work. Now let's just go back to MF for a second. Because I think this is very important if we want to if we want to achieve high performance on um, basically any any sort of database like um, application. There's a new kid on the block called IOU Ring, um, which is which offers really exciting uh, and and interesting modes of async access um, that that actually get really really good real life speedups. However, at the moment, it's Linux only. So, um, and I kind of wanted this to be a multi-platform thing. And developing on macOS, I can't really rely on on platform-dependent stuff. Um, I think one of the great things about um, 
about Rust is that a lot of uh, the libraries uh, that I'm using, like MemMap, um, they can do stuff that's similar uh, to other operating systems, native system calls. So MemMap does some magic on Windows that basically gives me the same properties as if it was a mapping natively in a POSIX Unix system. Um, it works everywhere. Um, the, the, the fact that we're using MMAP reduces the memory. This is called pressure quite significantly. And um, the way that this works is you start accessing data. And if the data is not in memory, the, that, that access will generate a page fault. Um, and the operating system will go back to the disk, ask the disk to get him the data, and then um, the operating system will put that data into the memory for you completely transparently. It's also, it's in mechanism very similar to reading through a file, but it's automatic and less predictable, which is sort of a downside. Um, but the really powerful part of it is that you get a slice that you can pass around. And you can design your entire data flow around this. Uh, when you have a file, you mmap that file, and then you just start working on slices and feed those slices into the crypto algorithm and you don't, uh, and compression and whatever, whatnot. Um, and you don't really need to think about copying. You're just borrowing that from, from that same memory structure that you're building, uh, that, that you're um, going to go through anyway. Um, I've done some tests and, uh, and the, the performance differences to uh, reading a file um, chunk by chunk um, is actually quite significant compared to, to whatever MMAP does. And the power of Rust comes in because, because we can pass these borrows around safely. Um, this is sort of a small picture, but the Cisco pressure is quite an interesting one. Um, what you can see here is opening a file, closing a file, uh, and mapping uh, and monomapping the file as, a, as in undoing the mmap um, is around 20 to 30 percent of the complete runtime, which is which is quite significant. Uh, we're opening files for reading and writing when we're decompressing. Um, we're mapping these files, um, and um, there's there's also some um, syscalls involved, well, native library calls involved um, for for actually copying the data out and into into our memory space. Um, so minimizing these these open operations can 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 be a huge win. Um, I remember testing at some point with uh, a kernel module that. Uh, increased the time to open a file uh, to around 700 milliseconds. And at that point, that is just ridiculously slow. Uh, obviously, here, it's, it's much better without, without kernel modules. But, um, but this is where the profiler can tell us where exactly our program is, is experiencing slowdowns. How are you always going to need to copy at some point? I think the, the really, really um, important part is to be able to tell when that copy happens. And if you just pass around slices and uh, are quite pragmatic and, and um, principled around, around how you manage this kind of data, then Rust's, one of Rust's greatest power is that you can actually reason about what happens at a low level in the memory. Uh, so you can, you get this very, very fine grained control. Um, and you can precisely pinpoint when that copy is going to happen. Related to this is slicing a slice. Uh, this is something that I ran into and I didn't really understand why things are slow. Um, the point is that I, I saw that uh, there was a function call and the function call goes into another one and, and there was some, some inexplicable uh, slowdown there. And what I discovered is that if you start slicing on a hot loop uh, on the hot path, then 
all the code that is generated by the slice access is going to be big enough to actually ruin the cache lines and uh, expensive enough to ruin your performance. So you want to avoid situations where um, you just keep looping around and, and slicing into the same piece of data over and over again, um, especially if you're like reducing the, the slice, because then every single time you generate that boundary check with the panic code, um, which could be unwind or could be abort. Um, and that can get very expensive. I mentioned cache lines. So one of the tricks that um, is relatively difficult to reason about in Rust um, is reducing the code size on the hot path. Um, inlining code will avoid function calls, which is a different type of cost. But there's a trade-off that we need to really think about. Because inlining too much will be equally bad for performance than inlining too little. I think it really is a lot of experimentation to figure out what it is, what is the sort of code that is worth inlining. And the good thing about the inline macro is that it still allows the, um, the compiler to not do that for you. Um, there's an inline always macro, which is a lot more dangerous because that will always inline that piece of code. So the boundary check and the panic code are, are big. Um, there's a trick where you can reduce this by using an assert macro, um, in which case you definitely want to because, because the way the assert macro optimization works, you definitely want to do all the dirty work in one lexical block or sort of one function. Um, and I think inlining doesn't work that well because um, my experience was that the boundary checks get um, generated into every single function, um, even though they are inlined. So keeping Keeping uh, the data on the same thread avoids us a context switch, um, which is which is kind of convenient in terms of pipelining our data and our instructions um, in an optimal way for the CPU to execute. Um, on the picture, you can see two different threads. One of them is an encryption, and the other one is a decryption thread. Uh, the, the top one, you can see that CPI utilization just climbs up. And this is because of all the page faults. Um, and this is what the, your IO latency looks like if you're, if you're looking at it. Um, the way the benchmark program is structured is that I read up a bunch of files um, and generate the objects. And then immediately afterwards, uh, I decrypt those objects. And it shows very, very nicely on the, on the second um, thread that since all the data was already in the, um, the file system cache of the host operating system, I could just go through them. And, and um, basically, uh, throughout all of, and this entire process, there was uh, about 100%, you know, like 80, 90% um, CPU utilization, which is completely reasonable. Uh, there, you didn't need any sort of ramp up time. So it's really, really interesting um, how you cannot really predict page faults. But then when your files are in the file system cache, it just becomes ridiculously fast. Another thing that I used quite a lot in, uh, in the implementation of Zero Stash was arcing all the things. Um, for those who are not familiar, the arc is a, is a reference counter that works in an atomic way. Um, it is super useful for uh, keeping track of objects uh, across threads. And um, it can also result in pretty ugly type definitions. What you can see here is a least uh, recently used cache. 
that I use uh, on uh, when when reading from uh, a directory. Um, and uh, I think we we have to agree that this is pretty ugly, uh, but it also it also allows us to to control um, and sort of automatically garbage collect all the stuff that we don't need anymore at the time of not needing it anymore. So there's a lot of convenience that comes with it. Um, on the decryption side, the, the least recently used cache um, actually gave me a performance hit around uh, a performance gain of around 20% when I calibrated it correctly. And it flat out crashed the program when I didn't. Um, so there's, there's that as well. There are some other free optimizations. I mentioned um, LTO, which is link time optimization. Um, the panic code um, abort is generally smaller than unwinding panics. Um, in a multi-threaded environment, I actually prefer aborting because it means the entire program is going to be brought down instead of just killing that one thread, uh, which is quite useful. Um, the link time optimization and the and the optimization level three settings um, best case around thirty percent performance gain um, on on top of everything else, which is which is definitely significant. It reduce it reduces compile time um, quite significantly. Um, but if you're only doing it in release mode, then that, that sort of compile time penalty is, is definitely worth it. Um, so one thing that I have not talked about today was async. Um, the reason is because I've never actually used async on this project. Um, I kept thinking about how to incorporate async into this pipeline. Um, but I'm already getting almost a gigabyte of second on small files. So do I really need it? And the answer is kind of, because this, this um, mechanism works really, really well on small files, but it does lock large files onto a single thread, which means um, if you're dealing with a couple of large files and a lot of, lots of small ones, and you're just going to block one thread and the, the other ones are just going to starve. Um, so async would definitely be useful for uh, breaking up the, the workload and the pipeline so that we can schedule them across num a number of threads dynamically. And uh, my expectation is that the, the profiler um, picture that I showed above about the ramp up of uh, the, the CPU use, that would kind of flatten out because of, of using async. Um, I have yet to test this. If um, if anybody's keen to play around with it, then um, the con I would really really welcome the contributions. Um, and um, in general, I think the async topic is is super interesting. Um, the primitives are there. The multiple the multi threaded um, kind of architecture is there, um, and I think right now the async ecosystem in Rust is in a place where I would be very, very happy and comfortable to, to build on it. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the case about uh, a year and a half ago when I originally started the development. Um, apart from that, I, I have absolutely like 100% positive experience with the, with the async as an async user, not an author of the libraries. Um, this is everything that I brought for today, and I will welcome any questions that uh, that you might have. And uh, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy you are enjoying Rusty Days and the Hackathon as well. I'm being told there's a tiny bit of a lag.
yeah, so we are just going to wait a couple of minutes. Um, if anybody has um, any sort of questions, then um, please shoot. So there's a there's a question about how uh, we compare read and mmap. Um, well, my my read implementation uh, that I did literally just walked through the file uh, bit by bit, and then whatever came in, it just fed it to um, uh, and just fed it into. the c hash hasher um which was so in terms of implementation it was sort of tedious because uh every single read can fail and every single read uh, i would need to handle the error cases um and on top of that uh it just generated lots of lots of system calls um one of the tricks that I probably did not um, mention is that there are not many allocations uh, during the during the runtime of the program. There's not there's not a lot of calls to malloc, for instance. Uh, it is there, but it is relatively insignificant. A big win is reusing the same buffers that you would be using anyway and just dumping them to files. Resetting the resetting the um, the cursors and whatnot, and then just dumping the entire thing into a file. So yeah, um, really, really there, the win is that the, you're massively reducing the um, the system call overhead uh, between um, between mollocks and uh, and maps and, and reads. Um, another question is uh, object storage sounds like sounds like Git and Arc. Um, they are the inspiration. I wanted to do something that's open source and encrypted. Um, a lot of the solutions out there um, they kind of work similarly, but you don't really know how. Um, and um, the documentation on on the exact uh, uh, crypto that they use is very sparse. Um, another problem that I had is that they were really really slow. Um, and so if you use a, look at something like Boop, uh, which builds on Git, uh, it generates a lot of small files. It is generally very, very um, slow to sync. I had the same issues with Tahoe LOPS and, and Tarsnap, um, where they provide reasonable performance for putting stuff in. But there are so many files that actually retrieving them is is taking an unreasonable amount of time. Um, if you're unfamiliar with cryptography, uh, one of the books were, that I, I went through and that I used uh, quite a lot was JP Amason's um, cryptography book published by No Starch. Um, the exact title kind of slips my mind, um, but it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good introduction, I think, and uh, and that is definitely where I would start these days. It goes through the historic things. It goes through uh, a lot of um, algorithms that are not very favored today in practice, um, and it just gives you a very good perspective. Uh, yeah, um, 
there's a question about how big the performance uh, in improvement was by using inline. The thing is, I don't really know. Um, I went through um, I went through a phase of starting to inline stuff, and uh, and then I started removing inlines, and I didn't really I didn't really see any huge difference. And I think that was because the code was generally very optimizable for the compiler. Um, some some things uh, actually had like um, a couple of percent impact when I was inlining on the hot path. Um, very very simple stuff like SRF and um, and uh, uh, other simple trait implementations. I think the bottom line here is that you kind of have to play around and, and see um, if it works or if the compiler does the right thing anyway. There's a question about how do you protect encryption keys and manage them from being swapped or read straight from the memory. So there is a there is an amazing crate called secrecy, which wipes the encryption keys from memory after being used. And um, I just had a discussion about this uh, recently with someone in IRC. Um, a great thing about Rust is that as a library author, I can enforce that all the key material that I generate or derive or, or or otherwise return to the users of my library, um, those keys will always be wiped from memory by the guarantees of of, of what I can provide, um, and uh, and this is this is really really great. Um, another way that you can uh, you can protect uh, key material is obviously uh, memlocking a, a process into um, into the memory, which means it never hits the swap space. Um, I think this is very often used. Um, other than that, I think operating systems started to introduce memory encryption um, schemes. I don't specifically know the details of that um, and, and how they work, because um, they tend to be transparent. Um, but there are no other special protections apart from um, for, for the key material. It's basically the, the role of the user to protect the keys. There's a, there's a comment about compression and encryption can leak some info on the compression ratio. I think that threat vector is mitigated by the, the simple fact that um, the attacker cannot know the precise size of the data. Um, so it wouldn't be very applicable. The, the attackers can only observe four megabyte blobs of data that are completely opaque to them, and they don't don't really contain any individually identifiable information. Um, all of the the, the root the, the root of trust um, in in this is uh, entirely derived from the passphrase and the username that are that are fed into the encryption algorithm. There's a question about what approach and library do I prefer for error handling? Um, I started off with failure, and uh, and that that was uh, that was a failure. Um, right now, I'm using this error and anyhow consistently everywhere, and I can highly recommend these. Um, they're great. They are super convenient, super clean. Uh, don't come with any of the baggage that failure does, and. Um, and they are generally just very easy to use and understand. Um, there are a couple of more crypto questions. Um, how do you do regular backup verification? Um, well, 
one of the key uh, key points of zero stash is that it separates the metadata from the data. Uh, in which case you can keep your metadata actually in a, in a separate space than your than your actual data, and using the hashes you can you can go through them and uh, and verify them, um, sort of extract them or or just even um, get all the data bits and um, um, based on the based on the hashes that are part of the uh, the indexes. Um, Guarantee that that stuff is there and and not uh, changed. Um, so it's it's very it's really trivial to uh, to detect um, the whether the data was changed and and actually a couple of things are combined so that it, it is harder for a for an attacker to to change data. Um, but again, I'm I if you're if you're interested, I'm happy to take this take this up. Um, and please reach out to me um, on on email, uh, and happy to chat about stuff like this. So, how you synchronize keys between multiple devices? Um, it is not part of the threat model to solve this problem. It is basically your problem. Um, or the or the user's problem, and I really really like this because it means that uh, suddenly the the storage and and the actual um, the actual storage of data becomes completely disconnected from how you manage the keys to access that. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of research and there's a lot of um, very good and, and novel solutions for key distribution, but I deliberately chose that chose not to include that in the design space because that's an entirely new challenge. And um, I really, really want to use this as a, as a primitive um, that you can build up on. Um, and this goes back to, um, to one of the other questions about data verification. The, the model itself of what you store in these four megabyte blobs is completely up to you. Uh, you can choose different data formats that you can that you can put in there. The fact that I'm using this for file encryption right now um, is, uh, is something that I had a need for. But ultimately, uh, it, it's extensible and versatile enough that you can create your own indexing mechanisms and, and build your own cryptographic um, uh, designs into a system that uses this storage layer so I think it's it's really good for composability. Um, there's a question about timing attacks uh, when, so what, what happens when um, somebody accesses uh, the objects in quick succession, uh, meaning those likely belong to the same file? So this is something that Ingrain D can pick up. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on the monitoring side and the detection side of this kind of stuff as well uh, in another project. Um, it is completely, completely possible um, to detect this kind of stuff and, and use some sort of fancy statistical analysis to, to actually start uh, deriving this information if you are uh, if you have compromised the server. Um, the gotcha is that you don't know if somebody's trying to restore an entire backup or actually just um, and and multiple files, and you don't know which files they are accessing. Um, and there are other vectors where you can you can actually observe how much data actually goes out on a on a network connection. So. Um, the, the threat here is maybe identifying users, I think. I think that's possible. Um, and I think that's, that's very, there's a very legitimate threat, but it still, um, still protects the, the user from um, uh, exposing the sensitive data. And, and, and so I think it's, it, it composes really well again. Uh, and you can, you can deliberately slow down the server, for instance, so that an external observer cannot cannot detect these timing attacks. 
Um, how does it handle encryption and encrypting data smaller than four megabytes? It will be just four megabytes. Um, if you have, if you have any any type of data, it's gonna it's gonna you're gonna see that as multiples of four megabytes, um, which is which is why um, distinguishing between files and different users if they are pulled together on the same server is sort of difficult. So if there are no more questions, yes. So um, I have a I have a role to give out a free ebook voucher, and this is really exciting because um, um, the best question wins the the ebooks. And uh, and I think one of the most interesting questions was. Um, uh, about crime and and the compression ratio by uh, on Twitch by Henrik Noll. Um, I think that's that's very spot on, um, and it and it's a good shout. Um, so I I hope you're going to enjoy your ebook. Cool. Um, I would like to thank everybody for, for joining tonight. And uh, thank again for the organizers. Um, and wish you um, a great rest of the evening.